We're going to take a look at activity seven on the total eclipse choice board. This activity is called Shadow Lab. Uh, this one is aligned to science content. Activities four, five, six, and seven are each aligned to a different content area. So if you teach reading, math, social studies, or science, you have an eclipse activity that you can use with your students in that content area um, that directly relates. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Shadow Lab and open that activity up. So as we're looking at uh, this lesson, just one thing to note, this is really aligned more toward fourth grade. And so students in K3 might need a little bit more scaffolding as you're going through uh, this activity itself, they might not have as much background knowledge, uh, so just be aware of that. You have your standards for kindergarten through high school astronomy, so that you are able to include those in your lesson plans, as well as long-term goals, so what you want students to understand, um, and then especially what you want upper elementary students to understand, so that the moon phases are not created by shadows, but eclipses are a result of shadows. You've also got some common misconceptions um, that you are able to address in this activity. So one of these biggest misconceptions that we see from students, again, because uh, Earth space is such an abstract concept, is that when they're looking up at the moon, uh, oftentimes they think that they're looking at half of the moon and viewing it as more of a two-dimensional object than a three-dimensional object. So we're seeing half of half of the moon uh, anytime we look up at it. We're seeing half of the day side and half of the night side depending on where it is in its revolution around the earth. Um, so this would be a great misconception to read through and discuss with students um, be, because it is one that they tend to struggle with. All the graphics from this activity can be found by clicking this link and it will take you to a Google folder where you can access the different uh, graphics we'll be looking at as we continue on. So just a note there. This first page is really teacher background information. And so if shadows is not something that you discuss, whether it's in your content area or your grade level, um, this is just some background for how shadows are created. And so uh, in the morning and the evening, we have the longest shadows that we'll see created by objects. And that has to do with the angle of the light source of the sun. And then um, around afternoon, the sun, the light source is directly overhead. And so it's casting that shortest shadow. And so as the earth, as the earth rotates from east to west, um, those shadows get shorter from morning to afternoon and then longer from afternoon to evening. Um, and then once the sun sets, you'll notice that you're not able to see your shadows with the same intensity that you were during the day. Our next image that we have here is looking at the differences between total eclipses and annular eclipses. Um, and so just again, having a graphic to show students um, how that shadow is hitting and where um, that path is occurring. So during that um, solar eclipse, we are inside the moon's shadow. Um, umbra is that darkest part of the shadow that you see here. And so that's where if you are inside that, you'll either see that annular or total solar eclipse. And then the lighter part of the shadow that you see here is the penumbra. And so it's not going to be as uh, dark in that area where that shadow is being cast on Earth's surface. And again, you can continue to read through all of that teacher background information so you can help answer some of those student misconceptions. 
Uh, these three graphics just show the differences between each of the eclipse types. So for the total, total solar eclipse that we will be experiencing, um, really both eclipses, the um, Earth, Sun, Moon are lined up along that node that you see noted here, um, which is why we don't have a solar eclipse down here at the bottom. The main differences are uh, when the uh, Earth Moon relationship is really Moon relationship is in perigee. That means that it is the closest point or where it's nearest to the Earth. So when the Moon is in perigee, it's nearest to the Earth. When the Moon is in apogee, it is furthest from the Earth. And so you can see that with the graphics too, that up here where the total, total solar eclipse that we're experiencing, the Moon is closest to the Earth. And so we're seeing more of the Sun blocked out as the Moon um, kind of comes between or appears to come between. Um, and then with an annular solar eclipse, the moon is an apogee, and so it's a little further away. Um, and we're not seeing the entirety of the sun uh, in the moon's shadow as we would with that total solar eclipse. Then at most times during the year, um, we're not uh, experiencing the moon or earth sun lining up on the node that you see uh, it going through or along uh, in its revolution. And so we typically don't have a solar eclipse at all. So lots of background information um, to kind of read through uh, to be able to explain what's happening uh, with that path and the shadows. Another graphic that is on here um, shows the total eclipses in blue and annular eclipses in red with all the different locations that um, people may have experienced an eclipse. And this is just for this decade. So we're looking at 2020 to 2030 um, in this graphic. Uh, you'll see there's a couple locations like that one in Missouri we talked about. Um, if you watch the video for the totality geography activity, um, where they experience a total and annular, um, we also have some places over here in Africa, Southern Europe, that experience the same thing. Um, a couple, or a yeah, a couple places down here in South America and off the coast that experience annular. Uh, eclipses within this decade, and then uh, you've got total eclipses experienced in Australia multiple times within the decade. But you can also see, and this is great for students to experience because it's another misconception that they might have, that the South Pole and North Pole also experience eclipses um, throughout uh, our 2020-2030 decade. But the big thing to point out is how many locations don't have an eclipse, are not going to get to experience an eclipse. Um, it, I mean, it's quite a few. And so again, having that conversation with students and even modeling um, Earth's rotation and just how all of those different components really need to be aligned the Earth, Moon, Sun in order for that eclipse to happen and be seen. Another really, really cool thing that students will get to experience when they are out looking at the eclipse and again, uh, lining up with shadows is how the shadows that we're going to see on Earth aren't going to appear as they typically do. So the sun's appearance is no longer going to be a spherical one. It's not going to be um, round appearance in the sky if we're looking from a um, earth standpoint. So you'll notice in some of these pictures, uh, student or people crossing their fingers and seeing the crescent shape. Um, that the shadows uh, from the moon will be creating, as well as the one on the right where um, you see shadows created from 
the trees, from the leaves on the trees. So this will be a really cool uh, concept to talk about, especially with your fifth graders. Um, it ties back to that um, behavior of light standard where we're looking at light traveling in a straight line until it comes in contact with a different medium. So with the moon being an opaque, a solid object, once its path kind of goes in front of the sun and that shadow is being created, you're not able to, uh, or the sun's not able to have all of that light travel in a straight line. And you've got some of those shadows forming in front of the sun and blocking it. And so because our light source is being partially covered, um, you've got these different sort of shaped shadows, which is really, really cool. And so that'll be a nice tie back um, for fifth graders as well. Um, just kind of review how light behaves and travels. You've also got some shadow facts. Um, so again, that those last couple pages were teacher background information. Shadow facts, these are ones that you can read to students um, and just kind of answer questions that they may have or misconceptions. We've got some different vocabulary that um, they'll need to know and that can be referenced during this activity. So when you're, instead of saying it's creating a shadow, you might say it's casting a shadow just so that they are uh, familiar with that terminology. Opaque is another big one. Um, you know, when referring to the moon, it's an opaque object. You can't see through it. It's completely solid, much like our school tables or chairs or desks or, you know, whatever we might have in the room. So if I put an object underneath my chair and the um, lights in the ceiling are my light source, such as the sun, the chair is going to cast a shadow and I'm not going to be able to see what's underneath the chair. So much like uh, us passing through or walking into the moon shadow, uh, you can kind of relate with some classroom objects that way as well. So for lower grades, this activity um, is more so modeling with a couple of students. So where you can go outside at different times of day, mark an X um, and have the same volunteers come back at other times in the day to mark an X and we're measuring the shadows and their different lengths of shadows at those different times of the day. So you'll notice that in the morning there um, will be a longer shadow, super short shadow midday, and then a longer shadow again in the afternoon. Um, and so again, as Earth is rotating, as it is spinning or turning on its axis, um, the sun appears to move in the sky. We know in actuality we're the ones that are moving. The sun is um, stationary in terms of um, what we are able to witness. The sun does rotate, so if that ends up being a conversation, um, that can be a, a misconception to address as well. It's just not rotating uh, to where we are able to see any differences, much like how the moon rotates and we don't see really any differences. Um, but you'll want to try to go out in the morning around 8, 9, uh, even 10 o'clock. You'll have kind of longer shadow. Midday, as close to noon as you can get, would be perfect. And then in the afternoon, between 2 and 3, um, again, will give you a nice long shadow length. So kind of spacing out two hours in between um, to record those shadows. Then there are some yes or no questions that students can answer, and these can be just partner discussions, table discussions, class discussions, um, so that they, again, can reinforce that concept. Now with our older, oh, I'm sorry, they can also um, draw each shadow that they see. So recording those observations, if you would like to. Um, now with our older students, they also have a shadows lab. Um, if you are in Garland and you teach fourth grade, this is pretty much identical to the lab um, that they had earlier this year, this semester, where they were investigating um, shadows. 
They might have used a specific object or they might have partnered up and had one person be um, the recorder while the other was uh, the one that was having their shadow marked. So if you do choose to do that and have partners, um, just make sure that the same person is having their shadow marked each time. That way you know that you're not changing that variable of um, height by using a different uh, student. So again, morning, midday, afternoon, making those predictions and then going out actually measuring. And students have a record sheet that you can either print or they can create their own data table in their notebook. Um, it's really just a, a three by three essentially, or three by four, um, for them to record that information. So the time of day, shadow length, and then they're adding that quick little diagram of the shadow and the sun's location so that they can also track the changes in light source with changes of direction and length of shadow. Then they have uh, some questions to continue answering. So conclusion um, questions, making sure they get their explanation in there, and then a summary of their data. And if you're wanting to extend this even further um, for fifth grade, for sure, possibly even fourth grade, uh, with it being close to the end of the semester, you can add a CER in here, give them um, a question and have them write uh, that specific claim and provide evidence and reasoning to support their claim.